great pleasure to be here in Manchester in your conference. It's not one that we've been to before, so we are hoping to learn a little bit about what you do as a, as a group of people as well in the questions later on. Uh, it's our privilege, though, to be able to present to you European Space Agency's Rosetta mission, which hopefully many of you will have seen on your TV screens and elsewhere in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, we have a lot to show you. What I'm going to do is start you off with a, uh, an overview of what we've done so far on the mission uh, from its inception, which actually dates back more than 30 years, all the way through to the present day, because it's by no means over. Uh, I'm going to show you that from the scientific and the technical and the sort of adventure perspective, and then Emily is going to kind of go back over some of those things and talk to you about how we communicated on this mission. Uh, there are many things that we did which we had never done before in the European Space Agency, and the first of those is doing a sort of dramatic intro like this, so I'm going to let this play. This works much better in a very big auditorium, dark, so imagine you're in a theatre somewhere with all the lights off. Um, but there'll be plenty of um, shock and awe in this presentation, hopefully, for you. But I'll start with this one. So, as you'll see a little bit later on, that's actually, uh, strangely enough, music from a trailer for a science fiction film that we made uh, related to the mission. And you, you'll understand in, a, in about 10 minutes' time why we even went that route. And uh, uh, it was certainly something that we uh, are very proud of, but it's part of a much bigger picture of outreach and communication. I think I needed to delete this following slide, which is just the same thing. Um, and start you off with, hold on here, there we go. Just to give you an overview, of course, Rosetta is perhaps the highest profile of European Space Agency science missions, but it's by no means the only one. We have a whole fleet of uh, missions operating. Uh, these are the fleet which actually, if you like, sit in the solar system and look out. Uh, the ones that look at the universe beyond the solar system are astrophysics missions, and these span the whole electromagnetic spectrum, the whole gamma to the whole rainbow of light from the very high energies, x-rays and gamma rays, all the way down to the very longest wavelengths. Um, and of course, unfortunately today I had no, no opportunity in time to tell you about all of these, but there's, you see how many missions we have, so there's lots of case conferences we should come back to and tell you about each one. Um, and similarly, we have a whole range of missions operating in the solar system, observing all of the objects, uh, looking at the sun, we have a mission which recently finished its, its operations at Venus very successfully. We have a mission at Mars, uh, one at Saturn. We're going back to Jupiter. We're going to Mercury uh, in the next few years. And of course, down here, you see Rosetta and uh, the famous Philae, which you will hear about later on. You can see there the object that we, we have gone to with Rosetta. This is a comet. But comets are fascinating objects and have been for all of human history because there are these objects that appear in the night sky and historically, randomly, that they just popped in, maybe you would see one several, a few times in your lifetime. They were not so rare that you, they were legends, that they only appeared once every million years, and they don't come once a week, so you get bored of them. Um, has anybody in the room actually seen a comet? I know some of you have, whether you remember or not. Um, anybody who was around in the uh, uh, late 90s will remember comet Hale-Bopp, which was actually visible in the northern sky for 18 months. So if you were living in the northern hemisphere in, in 1997, 98, you will have seen it. You may have forgotten, but you did. Um, this is actually uh, uh, from the southern hemisphere. We haven't had a bright comet in the northern hemisphere for, since then, uh, but the southern hemisphere has been lucky. This is from the platform where we have some of the very biggest telescopes in the world observing the night sky in northern Chile. And again, these comets are, are, are beautiful, They're stunning objects just visually to look at. But they fascinated people for millennia because they do appear randomly in the sky, or at least the ancients thought so. And one of the uh, best documented appearances of a comet in the sky was actually here in the Bio Tapestry, um, commemorating or commiserating, depending on your perspective, uh, the invasion of England in 1066 by the Normans. And uh, what you see here is a comet at the top, and that appeared in the sky in, in early in 1066. And you can see King Harold here being told that something bad was about to happen, because, of course, this is written after the fact, so history is easy to write afterwards. Um, and at the top there it says, Isti Marant Stella, these men wonder at the star. Uh, nobody had any idea what these objects were, but by the 1700s, armed with the laws of motion from Isaac Newton and also the laws of planetary motion from Kepler and Copernicus, a certain gentleman worked out that there was a periodicity, an apparent periodicity in the records of comets. And he saw that for some reason there was one coming 
every 76 years. And he hypothesized, based on the laws of motion, that it was the same comet, the same object, and it would come back again 76 years after the, the, the most recent apparition. He didn't live long enough to see it. So he was never actually, um, uh, never, never had this confirmed. His name, though, was Edmund Halley. And of course, we know of Halley's Comet, which comes back every 76 years. It came in 1910, and in 1910, we were advanced enough in astrophysics uh, to actually be able to measure the properties of the tail of the comet. And we noted, or the astronomers at the time noted, that there was hydrogen cyanide in the tail. And a very famous French astronomer, Camille Flammarion, proposed that we would all die when we pass through the tail of the comet because cyanide is deadly. Of course, he misjudged the amount of cyanide. It wasn't a problem particularly. <laughs> But come 1986, things were different, because in 1986 we were not only able to observe with much bigger telescopes, we were able to go there for the first time. And the European Space Agency built a satellite here, it was built actually in the UK, in Bristol, called Giotto. And Giotto was the first ever mission to go to a comet. But it didn't do what we've done with Rosetta, because in 1986 we didn't have the wherewithal to do what we do today. We actually, didn't rendezvous with the comet, we flew past it at very high speed. And, and the metaphor here is that uh, comets come into the, from the outer solar system, they spend a long time out there and then drop in rapidly and fly back out again. And it's very difficult to get from the Earth's orbit to intercept a comet and get on the same orbit. But what you can do is what you would do if you wanted to have a conversation with Usain Bolt when he's running the 100 meters. I can guarantee you nobody in this room could hold much of a conversation with him running alongside him. And if, if anybody is running faster than Usain Bolt, I think you shouldn't be in this room, you should be somewhere else. Um, but you could have a very brief conversation by waiting until he runs past you at the 50 meter line and jump out in front of him and you could probably have half a syllable of conversation with him before he moved on. And that's exactly what we did in 1986 with Giotto. We effectively stood in the way of Halley as it flew in and it passed us at 68 kilometers per second. And the whole encounter lasted a few minutes. This is what Halley looked like, uh, I was going to say from the ground, but it's actually from an aircraft in 1986. And that's the classical picture, a big fuzzball of light with a tail coming away from it. But we were able to see in 1986 for the first time what was inside the fuzzball. We were able to see what's called the nucleus of the comet, the source of all that gas and dust. And this is it, this is Comet Halley, as seen by Giotto. And one of the most remarkable findings immediately was that even though we knew these objects were comprised dust and water ice and other ices, we expected it to be white and shiny, a big snowball in space, and it turned out to be very, very dark, uh, almost jet black on the surface. And we'll come back to that, it's a recurring theme throughout the scientific part of the talk, as we'll see. But why would you even want to do this? I mean, it's fun to go and rendezvous with a comet. It's fun to do all the things we've done in the last year, but we don't do it only because it's fun. We do it because there's a scientific basis for it. And the, the underlying scientific question is effectively in this diagram. And that is that what we have on the Earth today is the product of many, many generations of stars being born throughout the universe over the 13.7 billion years since it was born. And in that time, we've built up, in the cores of stars and in supernovae, we've built up the stuff that we're made of, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, uh, and the heavy metals like iron. They, were not, they didn't exist at the beginning of the universe, so they came from somewhere, they came from stars. Those, the material was then incorporated into new stars. Our sun is only 4.6 billion years old. It's a very recent star in that sense. And the planets formed around that star. And then you get two, two important questions. Because when the Earth was young, it was very, very hot. So hot that it could probably didn't have any water on the surface at all. So the question arises, where did Earth's water come from? Where did this that we drink, that we're made of, if it wasn't there at the beginning when the Earth was made, where did it come from? The theory is that it came by impacts from objects that were left over that didn't get incorporated into planets, but that were effectively the dust under the bed, and that material, later on, about a billion years after the formation of the Earth, when it had cooled down enough, there was a huge period of big impacts in the solar system, possibly because another planet moved through the solar system. One of our own planets moved through the solar system and shook everything up and started pelting all of the objects at us. Uh, and the two sources, potentially, for that are the asteroids, of which we know there are many. They're mostly rocky objects, stony objects. They have a little bit of water in. 
and comets, which are roughly 50% of water. So that's one question. Did we come from comets in the sense of our water? But even more than that, did we come in the sense of us being life, of us being complex organic molecules? Because, again, the Earth would have been too hot in its early phases for, that to have, for those molecules to have existed on the surface. But we know that comets contain complex organic molecules. They store that material up in the outer parts of the solar system, and that could have then rained onto the surface later. Not life itself, but the building blocks of life. Amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, the building blocks of life. So that's the reason you want to go and study comets in detail, because they tell us things about the formation of our solar system, the origin of water on Earth, and the origin of life on Earth in some way as well. So Rosetta, the whole mission scientifically is about that. But when we were looking at communicating this mission, we launched, as you'll see in a little bit, we launched in 2004, but last year, of course, was the big PR campaign to get people engaged. We wanted to put something out there which would help people understand that conceptually, people who are not necessarily scientists, but to engage people. And that's when we turned to the vector of science fiction to try to go into a very, very different audience domain. I have to say, we were quite nervous about doing this. Nobody had ever done this before, and. Um, Fortunately, we did it in secret in the sense that nobody then doubted us, and it worked out in the end. But, uh, but the film served two main purposes. One was to engage the public, but it was also to set us up in a way, because we released this film you're about to see in October last year, and that was three weeks, four weeks before landing, when we attempted to land on the comet, and we did not know we were going to succeed. So we wanted to make a film that talked about risk, about endeavour, about what it means to do difficult things, not knowing whether we were going to succeed. And the overarching word which characterises this film and what we think we've done with Rosetta is the word ambition. So Emily will give you a little bit more insight into how that was received. My favourite quote about that was from Kirsty Walk on Newsnight, who called it the European Space Agency's slightly loopy science fiction film. <laughs> Job done, that's all I can say. But of course what we had to do was convert this uh, this science fiction into science reality, and we'd started many years before. At the time of the Giotto flyby of Halley in 1986, people were already planning what became Rosetta. That's in 1985, it was initially proposed. By 1994, it was picked to be a mission for the European Space Agency. And by 2003, it was built and ready to be launched. And just to give you a sense of the reality of Rosetta, you saw it there in the, in the CGI. It's a huge beast. It's 32 meters wingspan and with these very, very high-tech solar panels which allow it to generate power deep in the solar system where it's far from the sun but also very cold. And then you see the spacecraft itself at the end there um, is roughly two and a half meters cubed and weighs about three tons. On the side, you can see here is Philae, the lander, which is 100 kilos, kind of a big, big dishwasher. Um, and so Red Rosetta is the main science mission here with all the big science instrumentation, but it's Philae that went down to the surface with its small suite of instruments. And of course, working for a space agency, we can't uh, come to a talk to talk to you without showing the launch, which was in 2004. <laughs> So this is Comet 67P, meaning it's the 67th periodic comet, ones that come back repeatedly, ever found. And it's named for the two Ukrainian astronomers, uh, Klimin Churyumov and Svetlana Gerasimenko. So we call it 67PCG for short. It's a comet that was only discovered by them in 1969, and it comes around every six and a half years. It's on an elliptical orbit which takes it from beyond the orbit of Jupiter to between the orbits of Earth and Mars. It never goes that close to the Sun. But, but the amount of sunlight change between Jupiter and that orbit is, is very large. It goes as the square of the distance. So it's largely inactive at the large distances and much more, more active, as you'll see later on, when we've witnessed it pass through the closest point to the sun just a couple of weeks ago. 
Now, I said that with Giotto, we had a hard time doing anything else other than just running out in front of Halley. We did something very different with Rosetta to get onto the orbit that we wanted to, onto that orbit. We didn't have a bigger rocket available particularly, but what we could do, as was in the science fiction film, was use gravitational slingshots from the planet. So one year after launching, we actually came back to Earth, and the Earth's gravity effectively picked us and threw us faster forward at the expense of the Earth slowing down a bit. You probably didn't notice, but... Uh, um, and we did that three times in total at the Earth, and once at Mars. The Mars gravity assist actually didn't make us go faster. We used it to slow us down a bit, but make us more elliptical. Um, and during this whole period here of 10 years of flight, we went through the asteroid belt twice, so because we could, we just flew past a couple of asteroids, we targeted them and took pictures of them as well. You see the comet going through, it looks like we've missed it, but of course we're winding ourselves up to catch it the next time around. And we fly past uh, another asteroid here in 2010, and then we get onto the right uh, trajectory. But we're now moving all the way out towards Jupiter, and even with these big solar panels, we didn't have quite enough power to run the system completely safely. We would have been okay, but if we had a problem, we would not have had enough power to recover. It's like rebooting your computer uses a lot more power than actually running it in steady state. So we made a fateful decision in June uh, 2011 to turn the spacecraft off. We put it into hibernation. Effectively, we turned off all of the guidance systems, we turned off all of the stabilization systems, and more or less all we left on was one small computer which had an alarm clock on board. And that alarm clock was timed to go off two and a half years later when we came back towards the sun again. But the risk was enormous because in order to keep any power falling on the spacecraft, we actually span the spacecraft up like spinning a bicycle wheel. We made it gyroscopically stable to point at the sun. But that meant that the big antenna which we used to get data back to Earth and communicate was not pointing at the Earth anymore. It was going around in circles. So we had no way of communicating with Rosetta for two and a half years, and we had to rely on the alarm clock going off. So just a couple of pictures before hibernation. This is the flyby, one of the flybys of the Earth, seeing Antarctica. And then we flew past Mars, as I said. Sorry, let's go back. Here we are at Mars, and in fact, you know, this is a recurring thing, a selfie taken at Mars by the spacecraft with Mars in the background. Um, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, than you'll, as you'll find out later on. Um, and that was very, very, was, at the time it was called the billion euro gamble because we actually had to fly so close to Mars that if we didn't have the guidance right, we would have crashed into Mars. Fortunately, we have some very good drivers who uh, fly our spacecraft around. So we got to the hibernation exit point in January last year and uh, we got past the moment, 18 minutes past the moment when it was supposed to wake up and we had the world watching. We made a very big decision to have make a very big media event out of it. The engineers didn't want that. They wanted to wake it up privately and then tell the world the next morning. But we decided that you should do it in public. Because if you do, you have a huge event. And if you fail, it doesn't wake up, well, at least you've been transparent about it. If you try and hide it by saying, oh, well, it didn't wake up yesterday. So this is the, the look in the room um, 18 minutes afterwards. These are the people that have worked on this mission long and hard. These two guys here, Andrea Akamatsu and Paolo Ferri. You also see Emily sitting in the front row, uh, and she'll talk to you all about the social media and the outreach. So she was right there. It was built into the mission at this point in a very fundamental way in the control room. We got the signals back, uh, one from Australia, one from California at that time, and uh, the jubilation was enormous and very real as well, because again, people had already worked on this mission for 20 years, and if it didn't come out of hibernation, we had nothing, absolutely nothing to show for that. But luckily, and not pure luck, but by a lot of good engineering, it did come out of hibernation. And that meant we had a mission at that point. So you see Emily in the front row, and she's smiling because she knows what she's doing with respect to social media at that moment. We're all just cheering, she's working. And she'll tell you what she did at that moment a little bit later on. In the months that followed, as we started coming into the inner solar system, we had to do things in a real hurry. We had to get up behind the comet, catch up with it, then slow down. We didn't want to go past it. But we had to do all of this before the comet got active, before we got too close to the sun. So we, were, we, we came out of hibernation when we could, but we had to rush to get everything ready, to get up close to the comet, start taking pictures of it, and figure out where we were going to land by November. And this has never been done before. Nobody has ever landed on an object without having done a survey years in advance. We don't do that. We send another spacecraft, do a survey, then we land. 
Rosetta was the first time, and we had to do it all in a few months. So as we approached, we actually saw the comet in the distance. This is from Rosetta, and you can see it turning into a real comet. There's a tail there. As we got close up, we began to see a very unusual shaped object. Um, this was the point at which essentially the scientists were overjoyed because they thought perhaps, you know, they had a unique object, a marvelous object, perhaps even two comets glued together. Um, this became known as the rubber duck, as you can see. Uh, the engineers were horrified at this because they had to fly around this object, which doesn't have uniform gravity. Um, this was from quite some distance, and as we got closer up, it even got more amazing. So we actually got to August the 6th last year when we rendezvoused at 100 kilometers away, and uh, this is what we found, a remarkable object, very, very complex terrain. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, this is four kilometers from one end to the other. And when we come to talking about landing Philae, we didn't drive Philae onto the surface and say, power it down, and we picked to land exactly there. No, the landing of Philae was essentially throwing a dart from 22 kilometers away, and we figured we would know we would be able to land somewhere in a one kilometer diameter circle. Where on that comet is one kilometer diameter that's nice and smooth? So again, the engineers, well, everybody was getting quite worried at this point. But we had to do it. Just to give you a sense of scale, any, anybody up from London, when you get back down there, you'll see uh, you know, it stretches from Big Ben to the Tower of London. It's a big object. Bizarrely, however, it doesn't weigh that much. It weighs 10 billion tons, which sounds like a lot, but it has the density less, less than half of that of water. So icebergs are 90% of water. They float in the water. This is much lighter than that. It's made of a mixture of small dust particles and ices, water ice, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, but it's very porous. It's very fluffy on the inside. What you see on the surface of the comet, as you'll see in these pictures, is a very strange, eroded, uh, geological surface. And people keep saying, well, how did the rocks turn out like that? They aren't rocks. There are no rocks on the surface of this object. It's an ice dust matrix, which has been processed by the sunlight, effectively melting it and, and material flowing away and erosion happening from the outside. But on the inside, it's probably very different. But you can see the bizarre landscape here where you see things like boulders apparently having rolled down the cliff then you get vistas like this, where you see a boulder here. Gravity must be that way, right? So if you look over here, you see boulders there. Where is gravity on an object like this? Where is down? Uh, and it's non-uniform, the gravity as well. The gravity is roughly a hundred thousandth of that on the Earth. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. It's very low. And in fact, some of these big boulders which you see here, we believe they've been lifted off the surface. They're boulders of ice and dust mixed together. They've been lifted off the surface and slowly drifted and fallen down somewhere else. I won't show it, I don't have time to show it to you, but we have a, an object which we think is between 4 and 40 meters in size flying off the comet, which we've seen recently. So it's highly dynamic, and when you get to this kind of landscape, you really have to scratch your heads. And don't think about rocks, don't think about river, river valleys, don't think about normal kinds of erosion. And we have a lot of people on social media who want to tell us exactly what's going on here, and that's a constant struggle with uh, some of our friends out there in, in uh, the public domain. And then you have places like this where you see vast plains, effectively hundreds, thousands of, uh, maybe a thousand meters across. Uh, and we, very early on, that particular boulder there was named Chaos for its, uh, its resemblance to one of the pyramids at, at Giza. So I thought, well, you know, let's put some scale in here. It's about uh, 25 meters high, so I thought I'd put the real pyramid of, of Cheops in there. And as soon as I made this picture, I realized I couldn't release it online because if the European Space Agency was releasing a picture like this, well, you, know, you, you, know, you have to know your audience, right? Um, so it was actually released anonymously. It did go out, uh, not under my name. I made sure it went out anyway, uh, but I can tell you today that I did make the picture. Um, however, I didn't make this one, which is also an amusing one. Um, obviously a ski slope there. Um, and, and indeed, one of the things which we have to say here is that you're seeing these images, they're all in black and white, they are black and white pictures. Um, but you're seeing white, you're seeing what looks like snow, but in fact, in reality, this comet is incredibly dark. I told you that about uh, Halley earlier on. We've stretched the contrast so you can see anything. We haven't faked anything, we've just turned the brightness up, if you like, so you can see what it looks like. But if you do it to scale, and in this room it won't work at all because it's too light, 
One of the most reflective objects in the solar system is the, one of the moons of Saturn called Enceladus. It's covered in real ice and it reflects almost 100% of the light that falls on it. The Earth only reflects 31% of the light that falls on it on average. It's, it's not that shiny. The moon, although it looks white in the night sky, actually only reflects 12% of the light that falls on it. It's a very dark object. If you see the pictures of astronauts wandering around on the surface, it's very dark there. 67P has, reflects only 6% of the light that falls on it. So to scale, that's where it is. It's an incredibly black object. Uh, it's very much like the shirt I'm wearing, and this is actually, in color terms, pretty much what the object looks like. So I'll pass this around. This is an honesty test to see if I get it back at the end. Um, it's a scale model, obviously a smaller version, but it, it has all the real features 3D printed of what the comet looks like. And then, of course, we had a lot of questions from people. That's great. All these black and white pictures are wonderful. What does it look like in reality? Come on, show us some color pictures. So this is actually what the comet is like at the reflectivity. I'm going to turn up the brightness and the color simultaneously. And it is that color. It's very, very gray indeed. It has a surface covered in dust and organic molecules heated by the sun, effectively frazzled on the surface. It's very dark and very gray. If we push the contrast, we can actually get some color out. You see it's redder on this side and bluer down through the neck there. And that's evidence of water ice under the surface, just peeking up through the dust grains. And these are pictures taken last year. We now see water ice all over the surface. So people were saying, oh, there's no, there's no water in comets at all. Why? It's all black, it's all dark. Well, it, believe me, it's got a lot of water in it. Um, of course, we didn't just go there to take pictures. This is maybe a bit busy, but we took a lot of other scientific instruments. On Rosetta, we take pictures in the visible, but in the infrared, in the radio, the ultraviolet. We captured dust particles and measured their properties on board. We captured the gases, we measure that um, with mass spectroscopy. So we're measuring all the material flowing away. We measure uh, plasma as it comes away from the comet, uh, capture the dust particles and analyze them. And then Philae has its little laboratory on board, has cameras on, as you'll see some pictures in a moment, um, both through the descent and on the surface. We capture material, pull it up from the surface and analyze it on board in the laboratories. And we have a drill on board that did not work last year, or rather it worked, but because of what happened to Philae, as you know and we'll describe, uh, we didn't actually drill into the surface. We hope perhaps we may still get to that. And then we, we have a, an experiment that beams radio waves from one side of the comet to the other through the comet between Rosetta and Philae, and that lets us measure the interior properties. And then we can also send us, when we send the data back, we can measure the slight shifts in the speed at which they come back, and that tells us how massive the comet is. And so we measure the gravity. This is a picture here showing uh, the gravity. And as I said, it's about a hundred thousandth of that on the Earth. And so it's when you see pictures like this, this marvelous landscape with this enormous cliff here. This cliff is about a hundred meters high. And so many audiences, I say, you know, you look at it, you immediately want to base jump off it, right? Well, it would be very boring as it would take you 20 minutes to get from the top to the bottom. Uh, you, your parachute wouldn't work, but you wouldn't need one because this, you get to the bottom at a speed of 25 centimeters a second. So you walk off it. Um, but you have to be very careful. And I just, just for something for you to go away with, if you'd all stand up for me. One thing on base jumping you usually do to avoid hitting anything is that you push and fly out. Has anybody done base jumping? I mean, I'm speaking like an expert. I haven't, but... Uh, so you push up and make sure you don't hit anything. The problem is, if you pushed up at a speed of 0.9 meters a second, you would fly off the comet. You would leave it. And you say, okay, 0.9 meters a second. No, I don't know. Well, if you can jump four centimeters high, to do that, you have to reach a speed of 0.9 meters a second. So if you can jump to four centimeters, you can jump off a comet. So I've got my photographer. We're going to do it together. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> right, you all reach escape velocity from a comet. Well done. <laughs> Um, so again, you know, everything we sort of look and we think, we have to question it on an object which is as bizarre as this. This is my most technical plot. Don't forget it. This is the magnetic field of the comet and the plasma from the sun flowing past. And to try and explain this one to the public, it was turned into sound. 
So these are the magnetic pulses, if you like, as the plasma from the sun flows past the comet rotating every 12 and a half hours, speeded up by a factor of about 10,000, so you can make it to a sound file. This had more than 5 million listens on SoundCloud. It's been in numerous songs, people have incorporated it in musical pieces. It's been quite remarkable, the singing comet. But from the science to the, in this case, the sonification, not the visualization, is a long step, but people still love, gets very annoying at this point. So we've been looking at the comet and we've been seeing, for, for example, things like this. They look like craters, but these are not impact craters, things hitting from the outside. These are actually eruptions from underneath. As the comet heats on the surface, the heat seeps down below, it meets up with the ices. The ices then turn straight into gas, they seep up, up onto the surface, they flow away, and at some point the roof, like in a sinkhole, the roof collapses, and then you can get a big outburst of material. And so we see these craters, sinkholes, all over the comet. And we see material coming out of them, and indeed we see the comet is very active now. We're seeing a lot of material flowing away from it. And in fact, one of the most interesting possibilities, not likely to but possibilities, is that the comet will fall apart while we're watching it. It has a 500 meter long crack through the neck. Um, it may come apart at some point, and if it did, while we were watching it, then we would see the material on the inside, which is, if you like, the holy grail. The stuff on the surface has been affected by sunlight. It's certainly very interesting, but to see the interior material would be the ultimate. So I'm running out of time, but I'm going to tell you briefly about what we did last November, the big event everybody was aware of, which was actually getting down onto the surface with Philae. This is a, a selfie taken effectively by Philae with Rosetta in the picture. So Philae is still attached here, being photobombed by a comet. So, you know, it's a slightly iconic image to be 350 million kilometers away from Earth doing something like this. We had to land on the surface, as I say, we had to choose a, a, an area which was a kilometer across, which we thought was the best candidate. Uh, that's the best we could come up with, what's called Site J, or Agilkia. Uh, there's a lot of very rough terrain there. We were aiming for the center of it, um, but we, again, we were not guiding to the surface. We were throwing the dart, and as anybody's never played darts before in your life, go to a pub tonight and try and get, as we did, we got in the 25 on the first throw. We didn't get to the bullseye, so we like to keep the, uh, the engineers in their place. But uh, we did get to the 25 on the first ever throw on a comet, so it worked out very well in that regard. Now, if you're, you know, how do you do it? Well, if you're an astronaut, it's easy. You just do this. Guy. <laughs> Admittedly, it's uh, translating really slow, but at least we hit our comet. So that's Alexander Gerst on the ISS, so we actually so one of the benefits of working for a space agency, I suppose, you can get people to do experiments for you in space. Uh, there's a much longer educational sequence, 10 minutes long or so, in which he, he's a geologist by training, so he talks about what we really did. Uh, in fact, in reality, we did something much more complicated. I won't go through this. We flew around at 10 kilometers. We flew back out to 20. We flew up to 22 and then dive bombed with a comet. We dropped Philae off and let it fly down to the surface for seven hours. And as we pulled out with Rosetta, because we wanted to keep contact, we didn't want to crash into the comet as well, so we pulled up at that point and uh, watched Philae. As it went down, of course, to a rotating comet, it took seven hours to get to the surface, but the comet was rotating every 12 and a half. So we couldn't even see where we were aiming at the moment we threw the dart. So do that in the pub. Turn around, get dizzy, and then hit the 25. This is a picture taken by Philae of Rosetta as it departs. You can see the solar panel there. And Rosetta returned the uh, favor, taking a sequence of pictures of Philae as it descended down towards the surface. Again, uh, seven hours of uh, extreme nervous tension. And here are pictures as it flew across the surface, as again seen from Rosetta, so 1514, 1519, 1523, as it's drifting towards the surface. And here's what it looks like for Philae, the last 40 meters of the descent. Real time. Interestingly, that's made from seven individual images taken. We didn't take a movie on board, we didn't have the bandwidth, but we have some very good friends in the video industry, as you might imagine. It is what it would have looked like if you were sitting on Philae. So, of course, when we touched down on the surface, uh, there was enormous jubilation, again, from the same, many of the same people you saw before uh, about this astonishing event. Of course, the story didn't end there because 
what we know is where we touch down, you can actually see uh, the mark left on the surface at 15, uh, a few minutes before, this is the picture taken at 1534. That's what that looks like magnified. And this is the sound of landing as recorded by Philae through the vibrations through its legs. This is what it sounded like. And that's in real time. So that crunch, what it belies is the fact that the harpoons and the eye screws and the little retro thruster to keep us on the surface didn't work. And what we then saw, a few minutes later, is Philae departing the scene of the crime. So it flew off and it flew for two hours above the surface at about 200 meters. It bounced off a cliff at one point, came back down to the surface, bounced again briefly for, well, it bounced a few meters. It took several minutes to do that because of the low gravity. Finally coming to rest up against a cliff. And this is the raw material of the comet. In fact, the scientists in some ways were happier to land here rather than on the dusty plain because this is the stuff they wanted to see the raw underlying material. So a whole series of scientific papers have been published on analyzing the comet. I don't have time today, but what we know is where we think we've landed, you can see the two red dots there, that's where we first touched down top left, then we hit the cliff, and we believe we ended up down in this area, and you'll see in this movie from radio transmissions from uh, Philae back to Rosetta, we think we're in this area, it's a dark area, so Philae actually didn't manage to charge its batteries. It ran out after three days of main power. But as you will hear in a moment, it did come back to life again in June. We th one suggestion was that that is Philae. But in fact, we now know that it's got to be in that area. We have refined estimates, so that wasn't Philae at all. But the mission isn't even over, so I'm going to finish and hand over to Emily now to show you a couple of last pictures. You know, on the 14th of February, we flew past the comet six kilometers above the surface. And people were getting quite emboldened about how to do that. And you can see the surface here from six kilometers. We zoom in a bit. You can see the amazing terrain beneath us. And then this last picture is remarkable because in this picture, the sun is right behind the camera. And what you see there is the, the shadow of Rosetta being cast on the surface from six kilometers away. The comet has developed significantly since we've been there. It passed its closest point to the sun on August the 13th. When seen from Earth, it has a tail, it's a real comet. For us, close up, what we are seeing is increased activity. We monitor the comet all the time, we're watching it. We're standing back a bit at the moment, about 200, 300 kilometers, and we see this activity coming out as the comet rotates. And this is perhaps the, uh, the, the, the last picture I have for you, what we saw on perihelion day, closest approach to the sun. We see jets bursting out of this astonishing object. So for us as scientists and as engineers, it's been an amazing adventure to be on. It's not finished yet. We have another year to go on this mission uh, until September next year. But I think for you as an audience, what you really want to hear about is how we communicated that. With that, I hand over to my uh, colleague, Emily Bowman. Thank you. Um, I'm basically going to do the talk again, but from a purely social media point of view. And in fact, usually uh, my main role is in fact writing things um, like the corporate press releases that you might read. But I'm also very lucky to be uh, deeply engrossed in all the, all the social media activities as well. So what do I really mean by social media? Um, well, as a kind of a bridge between those formal press releases, we have the Rosetta blog. And that's a, a way immediately to give us um, a connection with our audience. We have the comments enabled and we can interact. Um, and we use the blog to do more sort of informal updates and solicit guest blog posts as well. So we have our, our daily or weekly kind of comet watch um, pictures. We have operational reports and we have um, often some quite technical reports there as well. So appealing to the audience that are, are really looking for the details. We have then um, three main Rosetta-specific uh, social media accounts. We have the, uh, the Twitter account. Uh, Twitter is the microblogging uh, website where you, you share your statuses in uh, 140 characters or less. Um, for us, this really became the, the leading social media account. It's, uh, it's, it's news-driven as well, so jur journalists look there for, uh, for information. We have the, the Facebook page, which has a really nice community feel to it. Um, we don't use that to make announcements so much, but it's more a place to share content from our other channels. 
Um, and it's become a nice place for our audience to share their pictures as well. If there's been a, been a local Rosetta event, for example, we will share that there. Um, people share pictures of themselves with Rosetta models and, and t-shirts and whatnot as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's a really nice, uh, really nice platform. And the same with Instagram as well. It's not, uh, not a high profile account, but it's uh, another platform that we engage with our audience by sharing um, regular images. Um, we also take advantage of the existing social media platforms um, that we have within ESA. So the ESA corporate uh, Facebook accounts, the YouTube, Flickr, Google Plus and Livestream to sh for sharing different types of content like photos and videos. Um, and this is a, a kind of a point I'd like to make is if you, you're wondering which platform that you want to exploit the most and you have to think about not only do you have the, the, the manpower to operate them all, but also the content to fill it. So we didn't really need to have a Rosetta YouTube uh, account because we could have a playlist within the existing ESA infrastructure and maybe we only have a video to release, whether it's an animation or an interview or something, you know, once, and, once every while, while, whereas on Twitter and Facebook we have enough content to, to have new and fresh things every day. Um, I've also included a screenshot there in the centre of um, a couple of the Google Hangouts that we've done. Um, so this is another kind of quite new thing for ESA, instead of having kind of for lots of, um, sort of like yeah, corporate level men in suits, higher level people giving presentations to the press, then um, we tried to engage with a, a wider audience by basically broadcasting uh, from our own offices and to, to give people a, a feel of the human angle of the mission, which again was a very important way to build our audiences over the last year. Um, how does social media compare in general to, the, to Rosetta's journey? So to just talk through this diagram, Across the centre is um, the journey of Rosetta itself. So over um, on the far left there is uh, the launch, and you can see that Facebook itself um, basically launched at around the same time. So Rosetta is as old as, as, as modern age social media. Um, but obviously, as Mark already mentioned before, Rosetta was very forward thinking and was taking selfies already long before, at least I'd ever encountered the word. Um, along the bottom there on the left hand side is when the main ESA accounts joined social media and then the things which I will talk about here on the right hand side are the, the dates when um, we launched our Rosetta account. And in fact there's two dates there for the Twitter account. We opened the account already in August 2012 um, but didn't actively use it until the mission itself woke up in um, in January 2014, but if you go back to the first tweets for Rosetta, you'll find a few just still sleeping. Um, and this really, this hibernation period that, that Mark already explained was kind of a really important time for us to think about how we were going to prepare the world for the comet landing um, 10 months later in November. It was not something that we felt we could just like come to straight away. Um, we wanted to prepare people for it, and I mean, Rosetta is an incredibly unique mission all by itself. We wanted people to be able to, to share, to share in that. And one of the, the key things about the, the timing for the, the Twitter account, at least, and this is a, um, uh, an excerpt from one of the, the, pr the press releases, where we said that we would basically announce that Rosetta had woken up via Twitter. Again, something quite new for the agency. Um, of course, you could be watching it live on the live stream as well, but really, you had to be um, had to be following on Twitter as well. So we had this period of um, well, there was two and a half years of hibernation, but probably in the, the summer before the wake up, we started kind of actively brainstorming the kind of things that we would like to do. And the theme of uh, of waking up is very clear. It's something that we will have to do every day. Um, probably you have some creative ways to wake up members of the family or your pets, for example. Alarm clocks probably feature. Um, and so the, the first trailer there in the top left um, was focusing on, the, uh, focusing on alarm clocks and focusing on the time, 10 o'clock. That was the time that Rosetta's alarm clock was set to. We also went out onto the, the streets and we had uh, a couple of, um, of these, these style um, videos made asking people what they usually do at 10 o'clock in the morning. And also, being a European Space Agency, we have a lot of different languages to think about. And so we ask people, how do you say wake up in your language? If you want to hear these, you can look on the, the YouTube channel. And finally, in the, in the bottom left, we have the, the birth of our cartoon, basically. Um, you have to, this was kind of December time, and we were thinking, you know, it's quite Christmassy, fairy tale, once upon a time. Um, we wanted to see if we could attract 
younger audiences as well. And in the end, actually, the cartoon has become um, so popular, uh, not just with children, but with, uh, with grown-ups alike, um, that I think we're now on our, our seventh episode is in production. And uh, if, you, if you told me I would be standing here wearing a cartoon t-shirt and with the soft toy there, at this time, I would have thought you were quite mad. Uh, it's, been, it's been a really um, overwhelming response to the cartoon, to the point that even uh, the scientists working on the missions will wear the cartoon t-shirts giving their presentations as well. So there was a reason for doing, um, for doing these, and that was to actually invite people to help us to wake up the spacecraft as well. So getting people to think what they do to wake up and how they say wake up Rosetta was all building up to the, the launch of our campaign, uh, Wake Up Rosetta, um, where we wanted people to basically take their cell phones and record themselves saying, Wake Up Rosetta, um, with the, the best video, which would be voted by the public as well. Um, the, the winners behind that would be invited to come to Mission Control in November to be a part of the landing event. And this, again, was quite a unique thing uh, to be done, so we had, uh, there were a number of news articles written about the fact that we were doing the competition. Um, and like I said, um, we were, were expecting people just to make very, very short clips, and um, this is what we got. So you can see that was... <laughs> productions to individuals and just the creativity really blew us away. We didn't actually have that many entries overall, just over 200, but um, they were worth their weight in gold, so they were, they were really excellent. And of course, all the, all the shouting worked because the spacecraft did wake up. Um, so Mark showed you um, the, the famous wake up photo down there in the bottom left. Um, and my favourite photos from this sequence are the ones before and after. So you can see the tension building, um, and then I'm looking over at Andrea because he's the one that has to give me the permission to basically wake up the, the Twitter account. Um, there's a nice moment there in the top right where he's just telling me um, that yeah, basically we're going, and I can tell the people on the uh, the ESA TV people as well on the voice loop that you know we're basically we're going, we wake up, we've got our mission back. Um, and while everybody was celebrating, um, I had a job to do. So I, uh, I tweeted the, the famous Hello World tweet um, and some of, the, um, some of the headlines which were, were written around that time. Uh, the graph in the bottom left, I don't expect you to read, it's just to make the point that we did this Hello World tweet in um, all 23 languages of the ESA member states. Um, in fact, I didn't, I have to confess, I did not do those tweets because one of the things we wanted to test, bearing, uh, bearing in mind we had, the, uh, we were expecting a much sort of bigger audience for Comet Landing, we wanted to check things, you know, practical things like internet connectivity and things like that. And as a backup solution, I made sure that there was somebody off-site that would do the rest of the tweets, but I wanted to do that one natively from, the, from Mission Control, and this was a really important starting point for our relationship between social media and the people working behind the missions as well. Um, so that the graph is actually showing a number of ret uh, retweets and favourites and likes from the individual countries and we learned that this was actually a really good thing to do and people really appreciated being able to share the news in their, in their own language. Um, in parallel to that, to the competition and, and to the tweeting, then we had um, a hashtag. A hashtag is a way that you can bundle together content and, uh, and link, link a conversation together. Um, so as well as the, the main um, shouting, if you like, coming from Europe, you can see already we had spread the message um, all the way around the world. And in fact, the, the graph on the left there shows uh, the volume of tweets that were, that were being made using this hashtag. The first one is at 10 o'clock in the morning when the uh, alarm clock of Rosetta was waking up. But we actually had uh, basically a whole working day um, to wait for the signal to arrive on Earth because the spacecraft had to reorient, and reorient itself. Uh, point its antenna at Earth, uh, send the signal back. And there's a double peak there when the signal actually arrived. There was a nice moment, um, basically around uh, around 6 p.m., where things seemed to be, you know, not going quite to plan. We'd expected the signal 18 minutes earlier. Things on Twitter also had got a bit quiet, and I remember saying to the person behind the main Easter account, "Oh, you need to encourage people to shout louder on Twitter, and then I think it will be fine." And so the second peak is a result of one of the corporate uh, main ESA accounts saying, "You know, shout loud, everybody! Tweet, wake up, Rosetta!" So again, this is a, a nice example of the, the power of a hashtag. 
But then we were, so we're at late January now and we don't arrive at the comet until August. Um, what do we do? Well, this is what Felix is doing. So just as with the Wake Up Rosetta competition, we wanted to think of human themes like waking up in the morning. With the journey and arriving, we wanted to think of, again, things that people would be able to relate to very easily. So like the kids in the back seat basically saying, are we there yet, are we there yet? Um, and this was also a, a chance for um, us to develop more the interactions between the Rosetta Twitter account and the Fine account. So while we so managed the, the Rosetta account, the Fine one is managed by DLR, but we use this kind of the journey and the, 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 the weeks up until the arrival also to have these nice interactions on Twitter. And another thing to mention as well, um, between May and August, the spacecraft had to do these 10 really important rendezvous maneuvers, so basically enabling it to, to match the speed and the correct trajectory before it could officially arrive at the comet. Um, each of these involved uh, the spacecraft firing its thrusters for anything between um, a few minutes to a few hours. And again, to build tension and to sort of build reality into the tweets we would tweet at the beginning of the burn and then we wouldn't tweet at all until the burn was complete as a way to say that it was complete. And we had a lot of people sort of just basically, I haven't heard from you yet, did the burn go okay? And this is something we've tried to maintain throughout the whole mission is that the tweets from Rosetta and Philae follow in as, as accurately as possible what is actually happening. But back to uh, the are we there yet theme. Um, we uh, ran this time a photo competition. We thought maybe Although all the, the videos we got were great, there weren't that many, maybe it was asking too much for people to, to make a video, so let's try a photo competition. Um, and uh, let's also provide some props to go with that. So we provided a certificate which said, um, you know, Rosetta's going to Comet 67P, I'm going to, and then people fill out where they were going. Um, and this is why we make the, the paper models as well that you can um, cut out so, um, to include those in your, in your videos. And we had a promotional video as well. Um, the two pictures shown here are the two overall winners from that competition. So um, this gentleman here had climbed uh, the mountain Grand Perro of DCO, I think, which is four kilometres high. It's the same size as the comet, and that was what his, uh, his certificate said. Um, the photo in the middle is actually a Rosetta paper model in a bottle, and the photo is taken underwater. So again, also playing on themes of the mission as well. But again, we didn't actually have a huge number of entries, but it was nonetheless that all the entries that we had were, were very creative. And in fact, the, the legacy of the paper models lives on today. We were really surprised uh, around Christmas time when um, our Facebook and Twitter feeds were filled with people just spontaneously sharing their, their paper models, decorating their Christmas trees, which is really nice. Um, in the meantime, then we arrived at the comet. Um, instead of just one tweet, um, just with words, we had the, a picture now that we could share, so the Hello Comet tweet, which again we did in all the languages of the member states. Um, we had some fun as well with, um, uh, with Captain Kirk, and uh, again, just building the relationship up between the, the two Twitter accounts. In reality, after arriving at the comet, there was only uh, a matter of weeks that the, the landing site had to be chosen, um, which it was. And then in late, uh, late September, October time, we had the opportunity to have one last competition, and that was to give the public the opportunity to actually name the landing site. Um, it was nicknamed Name J on, um, on social media, J being the original letter designation of the landing site. Um, this actually wasn't a social media campaign, although it was, of course it was promoted there. To enter you had to fill out a web form, you had to propose the name that you wanted and you had to give an explanation. And this was a competition that was run by ESA in collaboration also with um, the French, Italian and German um, partner agencies who ran local competitions as well. And so you could enter also in any language. And by this point, uh, we assume because the awareness of the mission was so high and because the fact you could contribute to history in this way by actually naming somewhere on the comet, we were completely overwhelmed with entries. We had 8,000 entries from 135 countries. With um, the, the winning name was actually proposed over 150 times, um, and, and that was Agilkia. And that's in keeping with the Egyptian naming theme um, of the entire mission. Agilkia was another island in the River Nile. So we're very close to um, 
very close to landing now, but we've had one more trip up our sleeve. So Mark showed you the ambition film. These are some of the things that people wrote about it. Um, we had a press conference in London to unveil it, and we'd invited um, members of the, of, the, of the science community, science community journalists that we knew, but also people who didn't know why they were there. So people um, such as like editors of science fiction magazines and so on. And this was um, part of the BFI's uh, science, uh, was it uh, Days of Fear and Wonder um, sci-fi festival. And so we made the, made the big reveal, um, we were quite nervous of what the reaction would be, would they be disappointed that you know, there wasn't really a big uh, blockbuster film. Um, but of course the twist was that there was, but it was actually reality, um, it's the Rosetta mission itself. And that was the whole idea, it's not, these things are actually possible, it's not science fiction, it's science fact. So now we are at the stage of preparing for comet landing. These are a few behind the scenes um, shots. Well, the, the top right probably are images you're familiar with there from the live broadcasts, but um, behind the scenes it was a hive of activity. Um, there were some scenes from uh, social media briefing meetings, and the, the main image here is the rare occasion of the four main Twitter account holders being in the same place at the same time. Usually we're dis uh, distributed across the Netherlands, Italy, and Germany. Um, and we're sitting in our own kind of mini mission control. The headphones there are linked into the, the, main, uh, the main control room. So by this point, we've built up the trust and relationship for people to be able to listen and to be able to understand what's going on so we can turn those into easily digestible um, tweets. And when, with a big operation like this, uh, you need to have a plan. And so we had many discussions as to you know, which order would the accounts tweet in, um, who would lead with what aspect and so on. So that's a, a piece of advice I can offer is to, to be clear who's the leading account and who takes which topics when you're running something like this. Um, and particularly when it involves 24 hour uh, coverage as well. So the day before the comet landing, starting off in the evening, there were these series of go no go decisions that had to be made in order to determine whether we would actually be able to, um, to land the mission. And it was during one of these stages that we realised that, um, that, that something wasn't quite right, but we were going to go for it anyway. So there was the, the thruster on top of Fine Lander. We knew at separation that it wasn't going to work. Um, and so those of us working in social media, we, we have to react to that in real time and consider the best way to relay this information to manage the expectations of what might happen or what might not happen. Of course, we separated and we have uh, seven hours to fill. Um, so again, this is a, a nice picture from what's called the principal, principal investigator support area, basically where all the lead scientists from the instruments are. Um, I had access to this room and I was lucky enough to be there um, the moment when the, one of the farewell images came down. Um, so the PIs are all taking the images of the screen. Um, the image in the middle there, I'm holding a memory stick, which uh, has the images on and then I was able to then share them for use on social media and to, and to publish them and to have them in the, the press briefings as well. Um, also at this point we had um, interest from Twitter itself, so Twitter was also tweeting um, and sharing the message um, of, of what we were doing. Um, the support and reaction was phenomenal, it's impossible to include all of them. There's a, a few, uh, since I'm in the UK, a few UK-centric ones. So the, the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum uh, wished good luck. We had the, uh, the Royal Mail that uh, surprised us with a, a congratulations uh, postmark. Uh, we also had a Google Doodle as well. Uh, if you can't read it at the top, um, also the White House uh, retweeted uh, one of our touchdown tweets as well. So it was really exciting. But you can see just the worldwide extent of, um, of the support that we had. If you've not seen it before, this is a scientific cartoon sketch called XKCD, um, and they basically live drew the entire landing um, throughout the day. But things didn't go entirely to plan. Um, had Philae landed where it was supposed to, then probably it would have remained active right up until March 2015. And then we would have been thinking around then, okay, how are we gonna deal with Philae going into hibernation or the mission being over. Um, instead, it landed somewhere without enough solar energy to continue its longer term mission and completed its short term mission. And we had to think on our feet. Um, and this was the final conversation that um, we developed. And uh, just to show you uh, behind the scenes, 
by this point it was uh, quite late on the Friday evening at the end of a very long week. Um, there was no scheduled broadcast planned. Uh, the event hadn't planned to be live streamed because we didn't know it was going to be happening like this. Um, we had just a few journalists left um, at that point, which we invited to join us in the main control room. And a few of us from the ESA team there sat yeah, basically the other side of the glass, but with the operations team coming out and giving us updates. And because there was no live stream, um, really the only way you could follow was from our tweets and from the blog. And this made that a really unique online kind of Twitter only um, event, which I think is why we had such uh, great interest on Twitter at that point. Of course, the news was global and we had, uh, you know, the more traditional way of, of sharing news with the, the front page newspapers. <laughs> Um, to share a few of the um, statistics, it often comes down to numbers, um, this shows the, the way in which our audience is on, um, the face, on Facebook, Twitter and the blog um, really grew. So on the blog, during the week, uh, Comet Landing Week, we achieved 5.5 million page views. We also had 10 million live stream views that week, which I think was even uh, the best event from live stream's point of view as well. Um, so Twitter, I've included some numbers from Wake Up Rosetta compared with Comet Landing as well. Um, Comet Landing, we were at the point of separation, we had roughly 700 tweets per minute. At the moment of touchdown, it was around a quarter of a million. But although numbers like this can sound impressive, they can sometimes also be a bit meaningless, and it, it's, kind of, it's things like this which, uh, which sort of show really the, the range of audiences that we've attracted. So uh, BBC Radio 3 um, actually changed their status to say, They'd love to be uh, visiting Comet 67P, but they're too busy organising the proms. So we've kind of reached out into, into the musical audience. Um, another Twitter user said, oh, it was Etta and Fide special on BBC4, I'm a celebrity, we'll have to wait. Um, and then there was a rather entertaining uh, hashtag which sprung up after the landing, which was, uh, we can land on a comet, but we can't, whatever. And uh, this one particularly caught my eye, we can't convince the self-checkout machine there's nothing in the bagging area. So this was a, a hashtag that basically just sprung up by itself and uh, was, was trending apparently at some point too. Um, for people like me working in, um, in social media, I was really excited and really proud that we were um, included. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know this would happen, but we were included in um, Twitter, Facebook and Google's um, year in search. Um, we also had a surprise New Year's Google Doodle as well, so I'll just play a <laughs> And while the, uh, the Google Doodle, which was um, created on uh, the, the comet landing day itself, we knew that that was going to happen. The one that was done on New Year's Eve 2014, we didn't know, so it was literally, I just went to search for something on Google that day, and I was like, wow, that looks familiar. <laughs> um, but, of course, it's not over with Comet Landing and the adventure has continued into 2015. Um, and so we're using the social media accounts to portray exactly what's happening, whether it's the new scientific results, whether it's an operational update, and again, when things don't quite go to plan. So Mark showed you a picture from a close flyby, and it was during one of these close flybys, a, a later one, that actually the spacecraft ran into a bit of trouble. Because of the increased activity, there's a lot of dust around, it confuses the spacecraft star trackers, and at one point we actually um, ended up basically losing, almost losing contact with the Earth and we had a, a safe mode so the spacecraft kind of put itself into a safer position. But we used uh, things like the cartoon to relate what's happening and how the spacecraft is feeling at this time. Of course one of the great excitements of the year was, uh, was feeling waking up. Um, it was, we were, it wasn't a surprise then, I think, that it woke up. It was something we hoped for, but it was certainly a surprise to me at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday when I saw Mark phoning me. And I thought either one of, one of two things have happened. Either the, uh, the spacecraft's had a safe mode and the mission was lost, or Phoenix has woken up. And I was very pleased that it was, it was the latter one. Of course, the reality is that um, Phila isn't yet back to work. Um, there were problems trying to restore the connection, but we really hope that we can, uh, it can be reactivated. And of course, the fact that uh, there, there isn't a good connection at the moment in reality means that the Twitter accounts can't talk to each other properly either. So it's, it's frustrating for us as well because we have lots of great conversations that we'd like to share. Um, and just to bring us up to the present day then, uh, we passed the closest point um, to the sun uh, along the comet's orbit last, uh, last month. 
we've celebrated a year in orbit, and we mark this occasion by having um, a Google Hangout, during which a number of the Rosetta and Philae mission experts came along and shared things like um, this recent image, which was taken the day before the Hangout. Um, so be able to share really what the, uh, what, what the comet is doing almost in real time. So just to wrap up then, I thought I'd put down a few notes of things which might be useful if you're, you're planning your, your own campaigns and things that I've learned over the last year. Um, so dare to be different, um, con you know, consider different platforms for sharing information that you wouldn't necessarily, whether it's making a, what was it, a loopy film like Ambition or um, using Twitter to make an announcement where you would normally have do something maybe more traditional. But of course, all the social media I've spoken about has also been in support of all the traditional media as well. We haven't scrapped that at all. That is, we still do that. It's just, it's all in support of it. Um, take risks, like Mark said, having the live streaming of a key event was a risky, but it paid off and it was all about sharing the, the, the human emotion behind doing something like that. Um, when you have a big, big event in a campaign, have rehearsals, practice, make plans, it's all common sense really. I, I've found it quite useful to have things like shared Google documents that people can dip into and, and change the order if they, if they have an idea. Um, learn from experiences, so for example, were competition rules clear enough? Was the hashtag flashy enough? Maybe you didn't get enough entries because of X, Y, and Z, and you can apply those to the future. Maybe you needed to have a different platform that people could enter. And that was, I didn't mention it, but that was why we had the Instagram account um, for the photo contest. We thought it might be easier for people as well and to attract, again, a different audience if they could use Instagram. And that was one of the, 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 the main reasons for opening that account. Um, <coughs> Think about ways to inspire the next generation. So we have a number of educational workshops at ESA as well. So we share with teachers how they can get the Rosetta Mission Science into their into their curriculum. And of course, like uh, Rosetta and Philae, looking a bit uh, well, awe inspired, I suppose, or horrified. I'm not sure at the shape of the the comet being a duck shape. But however much planning you do, then always expect the unexpected. So with that, I will end and thank you very much.